look at that close up on the shirt. Nobody will be like, what show is this? It's the No Fear Podcast. <laughs> uh, uh, Jamie, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm very good. So, so uh, folks, this is a, a slightly different No Fear Podcast than a lot. A lot of times I have on there, uh, you know, people who are military, law enforcement, somebody who, uh, people who, who, who've done, they got a book out, uh, you, you know, they're, they're web celebrities, a fancy word for, you know, a celebrity because of the internet. And today I've got somebody that most of you will never have even heard of, but the story, and, and I, I had this, this series that I, that I used to run and I loved it. Um, it was the idea, it was called No One Special. And it's not meant as a, an insult to anybody. It's like a lot of times the people that you listen to stories to about, they were in the news for some reason. So, but how this ties in and why I wanted you on the show is like for a system to work, whether it's a self-defense system, whether it's a coaching system, whether it's no fear, if it only works for the elite, and I used to make fun of this, like when somebody had their infomercial selling their their new product, you know, they would have like, like, uh, and this isn't a knock on Tony Robbins stuff, but, but, you know, he'd have like Oprah Winfrey and Andre Agassi and Miles Davis or, or, or I, I don't remember, but it was like, like people who were already the best in the world endorsing him. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, does anyone not notice that these people are already like way more successful than everyone else in the world? And at that level, it'd be like, it'd be like Mike Tyson at the reign of his career, bumping into me and me saying, hey, let me talk to you about it. And, you know, and then I'm there with Mike, I helped Mike. He was already like, like a killer and a world champ. So why I invited you on the show and I've had other people on the show and, and it's under this like no one special thing and I love the name of it because it's almost, and I want to qualify this because it, sound, it, it, it can sound like it has a negative connotation depending on how you interpret it. But I want you to think about this, and I'm saying this to you too, JD, and everyone listening. When somebody does something truly courageous in the news, that person, if they were truly selfish, doing the right thing, always said, like, I didn't do anything special. I just, I knew, I, I, had, to, I had to jump in the water. I had to run into that building. I had to stop them. I, I just did what I think anyone should have done in that moment, what I'd hope somebody would do for me if I were trapped. So that selflessness, that humility is that, look, I'm no one special. I did the right thing. And so that was the original origin. I've got a bunch of interviews with people who are like in, like, like literally in their death match, but um, uh, they're fighting, but they're no one special. They, and, and, and it's, I know I'm spending a lot of time on this because I want the listener to understand this. What that means is the, the skill and the, the, um, the fear management component didn't require that they were a Navy SEAL or that they were a cop for 20 years, that they were just, I understand what I have to do here. And so that leads me to <coughs> you. So I got this, this email from JD who I did some You'll talk about the background, how you, you know, uh, you know, how you found me and, and, you know, the interest in the PDR and the fear management, all that. But I did some private coaching. I think we only did one or two classes, right? Yeah, it was uh, one or two. Yeah, I, uh, I think it was like one private, maybe two, two, I don't even know. But JD is a, a volleyball coach out of Florida. And he sent me, I'm going to read this thing here, and then I'm going to turn the mic over to you. But I got this email um, on, on, uh, it was last month on the 16th, I think you sent like a month ago or so. Was it when uh, I think it was a day or two after. So I had to be in September sometime. Yeah. Okay. So it's like, Hey, uh, coach flower last night for the first time ever, the high school I coach had beat a team that they have never beaten in 20 years of sports at our school. Not only did they beat them, they did it in three sets in volleyball. That's the equivalent of a five round fight ending in three. I just want to thank you for giving me the tools to help them create a winning mindset. They put the past behind them, walk through the challenge door, beat their opponents. Understanding and training them to the, in the no fear program, the KRW field program was the difference. 
when I read this, I immediately sent him an email. I said, I got to get you on my No Fear show because I want to talk about that. Because what's exciting, listen, when I have a SEAL on or a retired military guy or, you know, some guy is like six foot four, he looks like, you know, and, and, and he wins a fight or he does something. It's, it's an inspiring story. But like this to me got me more excited in many ways. Uh, and, and, and one thing I want to draw out of it because I may forget is you're teaching these kids, they're teenagers, how to, how to play volleyball, but you're using this holistic approach that I spent decades on, on the whole no fear cycle behavior program. Are you aware and are they aware that you've implanted a formula to address duress when they're not playing volleyball? Like how they're gonna handle school or other parts of life. And they may not even know that yet, but they'll remember it mm -hmm. uh, down the road that, that, that you know, Coach JD said, I'm in the fear loop here and I gotta get out. But but let's back up a little bit, introduce yourself, tell us what we do, and then and then let's let's kind of like catch up to this this email. Yeah. So I've been coaching volleyball at the club level since 2006. This is my 15th season. Um I I've trained everything from eight-year-olds, 18-year-olds. Uh I worked a little bit with the USA high performance pipeline. Uh, doing some of their summer camps and some of their clinics. Um, as a coach, I'm, I'm always trying to find a new tool for my toolbox. And one of the things that I was struggling with, with this team in particular, was the mental side of facing tough opponents. Uh, in the gym, we proved that we had skill and ability, but we could never quite figure out what it was that was keeping us from performing at our best. So <clears throat> as a... Uh, as any good coach does, I started looking for answers. Um, I found the Finding Mastery podcast, mm -hmm. and I heard your interview uh, with Michael Gervais, and that's what drew me in. It was uh, it was kind of a light switch moment for me. It's like this is the missing piece to what's going to get us over the hill to that next level. So I reached out and contacted you. Um, we set up a meeting. I did the No Fear online and uh, was hoping to do the PDR, PDR course in Vegas this summer, but uh, COVID happened. Right. Uh, so <laughs> so um, once I got the outline of the fear cycle and we started implementing it in our practices uh, and really breaking it down to like what they're feeling um, and tying that to how they're performing, that's when we started to see an uptick in like, and even energy and practice, enthusiasm to be in the gym and work hard. Um, their grades have gone up. Uh, we have a tough academic schedule at our school for freshmen and sophomores, and we have a very young team. And they've been successful with it because they've been able to really manage how they feel about, test, uh, about test anxiety and, uh, and peer pressure along the way. Uh, did, did that surprise you that when you started in first of all you know the cycle of behavior and the flow chart for fear and understanding the fear loop it's it's pretty cerebral you know mm -hmm. like and, and for, for you as a coach did you have any ironically fear of presenting it to them and how they would react to it yeah, I, I have because I've taken some mental uh, toughness certification courses in the past, and we've tried using goal-based um, goal uh, scenarios in order to get them to, to focus during pressure. But what I found is like when the pressure's on, they don't give a crap about their goals. They it's, just- It's funny, I want mean, to you know, interject something here because you've done these certs looking for the, as you said, tools in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. um, and it's funny because I don't like that terminology and I'll share mm -hmm. why, because it's, then it's just a widget. Okay, I got mm -hmm. the cert. Hey guys, try this, try, uh, when you say zip fizz, does that help? No, uh, when you say uh, uh, AirPod Pro, does that, yeah, that, it's, it's, it's almost like perpetuating the superstition that all of us athletes have. Where are my lucky socks? You know, when I'm training fighters and they go, who's got 
can anyone see my cup? Like, where's where's my cup? And I'm like, use that one. No, 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 I need my cup. <laughs> Trust me, your stinky cup isn't the reason your left foot works. Mm -hmm. But we've attached, we've attached that relationship. I won last time wearing this. So without going too deep down a rabbit hole, I put this out to everyone listening, but also to you, that the reason these mental performance concepts didn't stick with your athletes was because they were like lucky charms. And unless there was a connection to it, it didn't, but even then you're creating this codependence on an idea. What's different about our program. And I'm, and I'm, and, and listen, I'm deliberately exploiting you and your experience. Cause I want people listening to this going, Holy shit. I thought Tony was just trying to sell us that no fear program. Like this is actually, we've had parents become better parents. We've had moms teach their kids how to swim and overcome their, that when you learn how to manage fear, we manage life. Cause life is, life is either, well, this is great or, oh fuck. <laughs> it's the roller coaster ride. You're like, wow, this is gonna be fun. And then you get to the top and then it does this and you're like, ah, and that's life. So talk to me about this. When you you knew that they were gonna be like, there's certainly depending if they're young with like uh, less retention. Okay, how am I gonna say, I'm not gonna say, pedantic obsequious and uh, neuroscience to these 14 year olds. They're not going to get that. I got to change the words. Okay. The 16, 17, 18 year old guys, we're going to talk about fear. They're like, oh, yeah, put your phones exactly. down. Right. <laughs> um, exactly. So, so, but what I love is that this stuck with them. And I want to share why I thought, but then you tell me, because we, we haven't talked about this at all. No, uh, like, you know, we had our call. I think we checked in once. You sent me an update with, hey, you know, you, like when you wrote out the cycle of behavior in your own words, uh, like as a mind map for them. And I was like, just good luck, man. Good luck, man. And then months went by because of COVID. And then it was like, hey, you're not going to believe what happened. And I remember us in one of our calls, in that call, talking about walking down the school. Was this the school where you said it was all the championship flags? Yeah. If that I just got goosebumps remembering that because I remember I remember talking to you going, when they're walking down and they're looking at those flags, if you're not demystifying that for them, if you're not changing their paradigm, then that is reminding them, these guys are killers. We're gonna die. These guys are gonna win a champion, as, the, as opposed to changing that. So talk to me two things before you get to that is it surprised you that they took to this stuff. And I'll tell you why. It's because, and this is hats off to you, even though I wasn't there, is you had already created trust with them and their parents through your own passion. And now you're bringing in something completely different and they gave you a chance, but you had to bring it in in a way that, that, you, that made them want to reach for the food if this is like nutrition for their brain. Because if you came in and went, hey guys, you know that mental performance stuff that I've been teaching you? I just got another cert and I want to try this. If you say this word three times, your brain, right? And they're like, okay, yeah, thank you. So what happened there? How did you present it that like you got them to consume it? And then talk me through that, that, that the walking and that, that the, the, the death tongue, <laughs> if you know. Okay, so, so, uh, the very first thing that I did was uh, I really scripted a way that I could talk to them about it in practice. And we started talking about our, our rivals who we were 0-28 against. Uh, even in our postseason play, we've lost to them. 0-28. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we, uh, we started talking about, you know, what it would take to beat that team. And I told them, because uh, we had done measurables, we had done our, our maxes, we had done our jumps, we had done our, uh, our skills training and everything. And we were performing really high. And I said, the reason why that this isn't translating into the matches is because we're afraid. Nice. And the very first thing that they said was, well, what do you mean? 
And I presented to them um, just basically like the situation that I talked to you about, about walking into the gym and seeing the banners on the wall. And you guys are already setting yourselves up for, for failure because you're looking at what they've already done and what they've accomplished. And we, uh, we told them it was as simple as this. It's, it's getting over our fears that's going to get us over the top. And it's going to get us that victory against that team. And that beating that team is going to set us up for the rest of the season. Nice. The, uh, I like how you serve that up because it, 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 I do a similar thing with if it's a combat athlete or a military law enforcement is explaining to them that, you know, not performing here isn't because you're not skilled. There's something else going on that on game day, all movement is mental. That if you're a SWAT team and then something went wrong in this advanced training exercise, you can't go, I suck. And that's what people do. Man, I fucked that up. I'm shit. I suck. No, you went through selection and you, you did all of these skill development and testing to get here. So why did you miss that shot? Whether it's a jump shot, whether it's a, a spike or, or I don't know volleyball lingo help me out here um you know or it's it's a shot which on game day you can't be a, a a different athlete you're not gonna be bigger or stronger you're not gonna have any new equipment so what happens on game day it's all about managing fear and hence the whole no fear there's no such thing as the no fear it's k-n-o-w if i change my relationship with fear in advance then i'm improving my my self-awareness so if I'm walking here and I look at the banner and I go, these guys are the best. And then I've got a reframe and I realize, oh man, I just triggered the fear loop. Okay, do some do some box breathing right now or whatever you're using, change your change your state or change what you're visualizing. Right? Yeah. Um, were, were there some specific things or 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 walk me through a couple of conversations where you where you reframed what the banners meant or what that walk could mean? How did, how did you help them overcome their fear there? The, the biggest thing that I talked to them about was the threat and challenge story. Nice. When you see that banner, are you threatened to lose or are you challenged to beat them? Because you know by beating them, you're going to be successful the rest of the season. Right. Uh, that was what the majority of our conversations were. Um, but we did have some on some individual performance things like serving and hitting um, where players were just afraid to mess up. Right. And then I asked them, are you trained or untrained? Um, <laughs> that's a great sort of just uh, interject. So that's, that's a line I always throw out there from Man on Fire, uh, mm -hmm. you know, when uh, uh, Denzel's uh, training, I forget the girl's name in the, in the mood, Dakota Washington, or I think. Um, but she's the swimmer in the movie and he says, are you trained or untrained? And it's something I always share. And I also wanted to just show this. I don't know if it'll, you guys have seen this on other calls. I don't know if this will stay focused on this, but, uh, inside the, uh, this is part of the no fear program. And this is a, a newer iteration of it, but that's the challenge that's threatened or that JD referred to. And when somebody's in the red area, which is the fear loop, they stay in the fear loop and the fear loop can be an emotional psychological place where, you know, you're, you're out on the floor doing everything. You're moving around, you're jumping around, you're, but in the brain, if your brain is in the fear loop, you're, you're going to mess something up. Even if you're saying don't mess up, that's not the right mindset, right? Don't miss this shot. The team's counting on you, all these thoughts. Um, and I, you know, I, I went through that. I, almost everybody who listens to the No Fear podcast knows my ski story of me, you know, as a skier. You know it, mm -hmm. um, and and I and I talk about it in, in No Fear. But for those of you who are new, when he said the challenge was threatened, or that's the area, that's that moment. But here's the thing: you can't you can't exit the fear loop if you don't have self awareness. So when we get a fear spike, we experience doubt. Doubt creates hesitation, hesitation creates procrastination or fixation. And now suddenly you're making mistakes because you're in this vortex called the fear loop. 
the only way you can get out of the fear loop is if you know what it feels like or it sounds like in your mind. What does that victim dialogue sound like? What are and what's interesting is also teaching people what some of the physiological uh, state changes: vertical breathing, breathing into my chest, uh, uh, you know, sweating in a way that doesn't feel productive, like you know, uh, tunnel vision, auditory exclusion. You you start to feel those things if you can catch them. You can extract yourself from the fear loop. I want to say one more thing here, and then I, uh, and then you know, uh, get you going. Um, to manage fear requires critical thinking. So here we have like fourteen year olds, fifteen year olds, sixteen year olds, and JD's teaching critical thinking skills, and this is life management stuff. You should be really proud of yourself. This is life management. When you say they're doing better in school, well, how can you know, how can playing volleyball make you better in school? Well, it doesn't unless you're being coached metaphorically going, this is an obstacle and you got to believe in yourself. And when you have doubt, you need to look at that, assess why you do. Uh, and then are there things that I know we talked about this, it, you know, if there was a stamina endurance, if there was a strategy, you could, you could replicate Hey, we're going to run this play again. We're going to do this. We're going to do this combination again, whatever it is, so that that you check off the boxes. Hey, we are good at these jump shots. We are good at these maneuvers. So, what would stop us from using that on game day? You know, um, how deep did some of the 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 talks get? And I asked that because kids, you know, the old the old expression, kids say the darndest things. Um, the one of the 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 deepest questions I ever got was by a 12 and a half year old girl at a seminar that she was dragged to by her parents. Everyone was an adult in there and she's sitting there. Her parents said, do you mind if my daughter is here? My son's here. And I'm like, well, they're a little bit young, but OK. I go to the end before we start anyone have any questions. And this little girl puts her hands up and says, hey, can you talk to me a little bit about like like the mindset I would need to deal with an adult trying to attack me because the size difference would be so intimidating. And I'm like, <laughs> what? <laughs> you're like, you're not even 13 years old. And like, like I've been teaching for 30 years at this point and I don't even have adults articulating questions, but it was all about fear in the mind. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, she yeah. was like, that was the little girl I was talking to the whole seminar that ignored everyone else. So do you have any like, like cool moments like that where a kid said something, you know, like, holy shit, they're getting this. Yeah. We, um, we experienced some adversity at the end of our season. We had a, one of our players uh, contracted COVID mm -hmm. and in our area, they shut down the uh, team for two weeks and it happened to be at district championships. Um, one of the players came to me and was, very kind of distraught by the whole situation. And one of the things that, uh, that we talked about was, was the adversity and what, uh, what the future of our program would be like. And it, it got into some areas of like, well, coach, am I, am I even good enough to be on this team next year? Uh, are we even gonna be able to play next year? Let alone, you know, we got a club season's coming up. Um, the kid was highly in the fear loop and, uh, I just said, there's, uh, there's no adventure without adversity, mm. right? These are the things that, that we've been dealt and, and we have to, we have to deal with them. Um, you can't allow being afraid of the future to keep you where you're at. You have to take a step forward. Nice. Nice. And did that snap them out of it or was it? Uh... Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, one of the things that I've noticed as a coach is uh, a lot of the kids that I coach, they don't face adversity on a daily basis. Um, so they don't know how to handle it. And as a coach, uh, and I, I can only speak for my gym, but I'm sure I'm not the only one. Um, not only do we have to provide uh, opportunities of facing adversity, but we also have to have the ability to teach kids how to face adversity as well. Right. Um, that, 
that's where the fear management thing is, is really come into play because a lot of kids, they, they ball up uh, mentally. They ball up and, and cry to mom and dad whenever something gets tough instead of stepping into their own and really learning how to critically think and get over any issues that they have and move forward towards their goals. Yeah, that, and, that, and that's awesome that you recognize that because you know, this, everyone gets a trophy generation and, and, you know, being coddled and, and, you know, the, what's been going on the last few years and it's been going on for decades, uh, building up to some of the craziness that we see where people are just used to getting their own way. And, yeah. and, and they still are in a, in a, in a horrible way, but I don't want to turn this into a political thing. Um, the, uh, so that's, that's uh, uh, amazing. Did you, When did you realize that, I, I know you listened to the uh, Finding Mastery interview and I've gotten like crazy feedback from that, that mm -hmm. talk with Michael Gervais. Um, uh, when, when did you realize that this might be a secret weapon for you? Oh, um, it was actually during that podcast. Uh, oh. Because I was always thinking there's there's this miss between what we are teaching them and them applying it. Um, it's the moment where they have to they have to meet the uh, the action, right? right? They're they're coming in. They have to they have to perform right now. And uh, I think volleyball especially, it's very critical that you're able to meet that moment all the time because the ball never stops. If the ball stops, the opponent gets a point. Right. right, so you can't you can't just hold on to it and set up a play. Um, right. There's no there's no real big pauses like there is in some other sports between uh, between plays. It's constantly going, constantly moving. So it's critical. I, I never, I never, I, you know, I'm not great at volleyball. I played it recreationally, but I never thought about that uh, in every, in almost every sport. There's there's a there's an opportunity for a pause, you know even you know even football you know you can be there like this going oh there i'll throw it you know but there's a there's a moment where you're but in volleyball you're right there's like it's just never stopped okay go on this is cool so it, it's even more critical for them uh to be able to make those decisions on the fly and when i heard your uh interview with michael Bay, that was when I, I realized like this is this is the missing piece this is what's going to get us through that mental toughness stuff, and it's gonna actually teach them how to be resilient. This is like the framework to how to do this. It's not just uh, another, like they'll get it eventually. No, this is how we do it. Did, did you as a coach, you know, you got a limited amount of time to, you know, hey, practice is this long, kids are getting picked up, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, did, you, did you do in terms of, of how you onboarded them with this, with the whole no fear package? Did, did you weave it in? Did you do some say, guys, uh, next practice of all whiteboard, I wanna show you some stuff. And then you would sprinkle magic dust as needed. How did, how did you roll it out? So uh, we had the initial conversation about our rivals um, and that led to the whiteboard getting pulled out. I showed them cycle of fear um, and really kind of discuss each, each every point uh, and then as we were going through the season and we would meet those moments, we'd say, hey, where are you at? And someone would admit, it, admit that they were in the fear loop and others were like, well, I don't think it's fear. They try to <laughs> try to cover it up with, with right. sugar or something to, to make it taste better. But really what it boiled down to is, is there was fear in there. Um, a lot of it was like, I'm afraid to mess up because the team is doing so well. Right. So it, we had gotten it, through that. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. And I just want to show something. This, this is JD's um, uh, version of what I showed you before. I'm just trying to zoom it in here. But, and, and I'm just showing this because you can see it's just a whiteboard at the gym. It doesn't have to, it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, like this, you know, fan. I know that's out of focus there, guys. 
but when you understand it, you can just take people through. It's a script map. And, and I've got uh, psychologists using this and helping people, you know, with fear, trauma, anxiety, PTSD, say here, you're in the fear loop. You got to get here. Uh, what's interesting is how you're identified. Like, you know, I, I make this joke as, as a, as a fear management coach, people don't want to talk about that because people, people, especially guys don't want to admit to fear, you know, who are taught through, you know, movies and comics and what other bullshit influences our, our narrative is like, no, there's, it's no fear. Right. And, um, uh, so I always make this joke that fear management needs new management, <laughs> that, that the word fear needs management because it shouldn't be a stigma. It shouldn't be a, like, if you can look at somebody and go, holy fuck, am I scared? Like without it sounding like just, you're just talking about it because mm -hmm. what you do then is you create an opportunity for authenticity and transparency to talk about what you need to do. Yes. So, so, you know, you know, when the guy, when, when the kid goes, oh, I'm not afraid, I'm just da, 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 da. If you get them to say, well, performance anxiety isn't the same as I'm afraid of these people like, like, like fear of violence. Mm -hmm. It's just understanding that, that until you admit the fear, the fear experience can't be cathartic or converted into fuel. And I'll say that again, that's a very interesting uh, principle. When I'm, when I'm going, no, I'm not afraid, but clearly everyone else can see that I'm wrestling with some sort of demon about something. I don't care if we win or lose, it's just a game. <laughs> you're, very, you're very defensive for someone who doesn't care, mm -hmm. right? Abrasive. Um, to, you know, when I started teaching my garage gym class in, in April 1st, I said to my wife, I've been teaching at this point 43 years. Inarguably, I'm probably the, the most experienced spear system instructor in the world since I developed it. Right? Mm -hmm. But I said to my wife, walking through this door to come in here, I said, I am so fucking nervous. And she's like, what? I go, yeah, I've, like, I've had anxiety for the last two hours. My stomach went butterflies. And she's like, how could you be nervous? You're like the best spear instructor in the world. And you're, you're you're, you're doing a Zoom call with people who aren't even there. And you've done, like I was using Zoom to teach for years before. So it wasn't like something new. Yeah. And I said to her, it's because I want it to be amazing. Because I've written a new class for these people and I want this to really take off. We had hundreds of people sign up. And it was only in my ability to admit that I felt this way and bring it out in the open that I identified by identifying what my concern was, I could then redirect my energy back to the class. Yeah. And so as a coach, and I'm sharing this with everybody, that when you have an athlete and that athlete is a metaphor for your wife, your husband, your kid, your mom, and you could see that body language is 60% of communication. And there's that kid on the bus or sitting on a bench they're like this and everyone else is joking and they're like hey where's your head at nothing what you're worrying about because you're i told you you're starting right yeah, yeah i'm good and if they can't say coach i i'm, I'm sorry, i don't want to let the team down remember my ski story was all about me saying if i'm so good why am i so scared because i was i was assigning the butterflies in my stomach and the adrenaline to lack of preparation. No one had ever said to me, when your body's getting prepared for adventure or danger or risk or something, some drama in your life, that you're going to get an adrenaline dump. Well, no one had told me that as a kid. If someone had said to me, that just means you're fucking ready to go, maybe I'd have started winning races. But I looked at the butterflies and the vertical breathing as like, I, maybe I'm not supposed to be here. Right. So, so we talked about, we talked about the physiological uh, similarities between being nervous and being excited. 
Okay, good. You know, really, they're really almost the same thing. You know, heart race, you get a little sweaty, shortness of breath, you start to get tunnel vision, all those things. And we taught them that like that adrenaline dump can be a superpower for you, right? right. And supercharge your, your performance. Um, so we, ha we had some times where we got to reframe that for some players and they really came back and played stronger for us. Nice. Um, I remember our first match of the season, uh, everybody's nervous. We've been practicing because we had a, a, a late start to the season. Um, everybody's nervous because it's the first match and this team went 19 and six last year. Mm. And uh, the very first question I asked them, are you challenged or threatened? Nice. And they're all challenged. Are you trained or untrained? Trained. What's the <laughs> difference between being nervous and excited? Mindset. And they went out there and they <laughs> they beat that team into the ground. So it was a great performance all around. And I think in years past, that would have been that would have been a challenge for us. Uh, but definitely no fear has really helped us uh, nice. manage that performance. That's amazing. I'm so excited for you and them. Hey, listen, the, uh, you know, what's interesting is if, if you, if you win and you can't define why you won, then you're not sure why you won and you can't replicate it. Yeah. Right. So let's right. say you had beaten them because you guys, you did something, guys, we're going to try like some meditation for a second. Let's hold hands. Let's chant this. Uh, here's some magic dust. You know, oh, I heard uh, the, the, this is the gum that the world's best volleyball player chewed during the Olympics. You know, we do all these like, like, <laughs> and if they won, they've created this illusion and still a different type of fear loop of, you know, what do you mean Coach JD's not here today? Though I need him here. He said something. My whole thing as a coach is always trying to demystify this codependence that athletes have and, and make them realize you're responsible for your success. And if it's a team sport, collectively, you guys function as one, but you got to show up. Yep. And, and I talk about what is the way to fear? Because if you're worrying about stuff, you're not talking about that weighs you down. That changes the speed of transmission of making a play because you've got to wrestle through self-doubt for a moment. So it's, it's, it's amazing that, that, that you did that. And I'm excited that uh, that that the whole program uh, has worked like that. I'm sure it changes when you guys when you guys. What was the reaction like? Last question. Well, what was the what was the reaction like when you guys beat? Like, what prompted the letter? The team that you guys had never beaten in 20 years. What was what was the kids like emotionally? Uh, it was, it was like they, they had won a gold medal. It was at home. Oh, I freaking out. Yeah, it was at home. It was in front of our, our oh, home. Wow. It was, uh, it was, it was electric. You could feel the energy. You could feel. I got, I got goosebumps. Yeah. For <laughs> yeah. Still thinking about it today. Like it's, it was an awesome, awesome moment for us. Um, and we, we beat them the next time we played them at their house too. And nice. it was the same thing. We just came in um, and dominated the match. That's and, so and it was cool. all because our mindset was right. on the right track. Right. I forget what I said to you. There was something about when I realized that was the, the issue of like walking down and you go into, and you're playing in someone else's home and they got all the banners from decades. You can mm -hmm. walk through there and go, I know let's how to get do one of these. <laughs> that? Let's get one of these. Yeah, let's get let's get one of these, or, or we can beat them. Or the, you know, uh, uh, there's so many things that come to mind. And all the reframes. You can only come up with a creative reframe mm -hmm. if you give yourself permission to marinate in the fear. Yeah. Otherwise, you're 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 like, what do you guys think about that? It's like, no problem. We got them. And like. <laughs> Like, you know, that's that bravado shit that doesn't, you gotta, you gotta get in there. You gotta get deep, man. I love it. I love it. So, um, super cool. Thank you for coming on the show and, yeah. and, and sharing this. Um, and, uh, you know, any, 
any uh, parting thoughts or anything you want to share, or anything I didn't ask you that you want you were hoping we would talk about? Uh, the big thing that I think was a big takeaway for me was when you said mindset is a movie set and you're the director. Oh, the mindset's a movie set and you're the director, yeah. Um, I can't tell you how many times like that was a trigger for some of these girls over the season to uh, to come back to thinking about you know how they were feeling in that moment and being more present and, and really focused in on that challenge or threatened or um, and when we put it in when we put it in those words it really resonated with them and you could see the light bulb come on their eyes got big they got excited uh, that was a huge huge thing for them isn't that cool man yeah I, lo I love that metaphor and, and uh, I don't remember when when I started when I when I came up with it and, and it's 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 morphed into you know more since that it's you're the script screenwriter you're the casting director you cast yourself as a victim and you just say these things so people have this catalog of ideas and the goal of that for anyone who hasn't heard or listening to this for the first time is a stimulus gets introduced it could be the banner and 20 years of defeats it could be you know uh uh um you're you're following some online blog about volleyball and next week we're going to crush jd's team and you read and that becomes your narrative and you go well there's no reason but recognizing that what happened there is that stimulus triggered this this fear factory where you start this production studio in your brain the next thing you know you're sitting there for five minutes or five hours going oh and you're just running this negative and it's just this, this movie metaphor where I go, you're the director, you're the producer, and you're the casting director, and you're the screenwriter, and everything you hear in your head, you're saying to yourself, and you've cast yourself as a victim. Yeah. And you need to be the action hero. You need to be the hero in your story as the metaphor goes. What would you do? What would you change? And it's got to start. It's got to start with the inner dialogue. So the whole, the whole point of the Know Fear program is how do we teach people how to coach themselves? Because in that moment, you got to catch yourself and go, hey, shut this movie, play something different. And then that becomes fun. It's a fun game when you do that. I mean, I do it. I've been teaching it for years. I do it every day. Something happens and I go, you know, I hear something in the news and my brain starts to do this and I go, stop, stop. <laughs> Back here, focus on this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome, man. Well, I'm very proud of you and I'm, and I'm, and I'm excited for, for the team. And the, and, and the parents who don't even realize that, you know, you're a true coach, man. And there's a lot of coaches who aren't coaches. There's a lot of coaches that are really gym teachers and PT instructors. And I talk about the progression of technician, trainer, coach. Everyone calls themselves a coach because that's the title. I'm hired as the coach. But they're really technicians or trainers. The technician goes, here's how you hold the ball. Here's how you hit the ball. Here's how you serve. The trainer knows how to take the skill sets of that particular sport, whether it's hockey or volleyball, and then create drills that give the illusion that this is what's needed to win the game and play at your highest level. But to play at your highest level is understanding fear and self-mastery. And only a coach can look at somebody's body language or their tone and go, there's something wrong with this athlete. And the answer isn't, well, go, go serve 100 more serves until you master it. Because you can have that masterful, how's my, how's my form? You can have that, you can, you, you can have the mastery of the, of the athleticism, but there's lots of people that still choke under pressure. And the difference, the difference between choking and freezing is the untrained person freezes, the trained person chokes because of the pressure. And until you can change uh, uh, fear and your relationship with fear and make it cathartic and make it a fuel, you're at the mercy of the movie in your mind. Absolutely. Dude, uh, and you cool. call me a coach, man. That's, uh, that's huge. Um, yeah, you are. You are. You are. Listen. I appreciate that. Yeah, the, the, you are. Because like, being able to talk about fear to teenagers and get them to respond Dude, that's coaching that's coaching absolutely you know parents can't do that so they're very lucky to have you um when we release this hopefully you you shared and these parents 
invest the 45 minutes to listen to it because I don't think they realize the framework and formula that you imprinted in these kids' minds. And when they stop playing volleyball, if they do, or something, some other obstacle faces them and they re- they're going to recognize, that's the whole thing about that the the whole idea of this is to create self-awareness because only through self-awareness can you have critical thinking and only through critical thinking thinking can you extract yourself from the fear loop and Absolutely. go, you know, okay, I'm in the fear loop and recognizing that there are things we need to do afraid and then that just becomes that I'm using fear as fuel. That's what I'm, I'm now going to exploit this adrenaline. Okay, man, we could talk forever. Thank you so much. Yeah, for yeah. thank you, thank you. Uh, be safe, man, and... and uh, when the world turns back on, I'll see you at one of the PDR courses. Absolutely. Take care, buddy. Thanks. We actually signed off, and then JD started to say something. One of you and Dad, go ahead, but start re- rewind to technician trainer coach. All right. Uh, like I was saying, uh, I really appreciate you giving me the title coach. Um, I, I know that I am a technician and a trainer. Uh, I've been in some of the best gyms in the country with some of the best coaching minds. Uh, I know our our techniques and tactics are on point, um, but I knew that there was more that I needed to master uh, in order to to achieve that level of coach. Um, And I I spent the time and invested the time in the no fear system, man, and it it has made a huge difference, Uh, not only for them, but for me as well. I approach matches a lot differently now too. Um, I don't don't get the performance anxiety of, of being a coach I can remove myself from a lot more of the situations that I tro- I had trouble with before. So I really appreciate you and, and the no fear system. Dude, uh, that, that, that means a ton to me. And, and, you know, you've got a high level of self-awareness that, that I don't know that you're to, to know that like as a seeker, okay, I, what if I'm missing something here and to keep going out there, but to realize that, you know, you, you, you always you call yourself a coach, but then something something hit you realizing, you know, and I say this to be provocative on, on any of those talks. I know I said it on Jervis thing, you know, technician, trainer, coach. There's lots of coaches that are really just technicians. But they're there blowing a whistle, going do more reps, do this again. They're technicians and trainers. The coach is all about inspiring performance. And and I believe when you peel that onion, that it all comes down to fear. And it may not be fear of the match there, like in my case with the skiing. I was, I was afraid of something different. I wasn't afraid of the hill or the course. I showed up. I wiped out every course trying too hard. I wasn't afraid to ski hard. I was really good, but something wasn't there. And my ski coach was actually a ski trainer. He, he yeah. coached me for five years, but didn't help me overcome that fear because he didn't recognize it. He never yeah. once said to me, how can we keep falling? <laughs> <laughs> why are you out of control? You're one of the yeah. best skiers on the team, but why do you keep wiping out? Trying to wipe it. I was trying to catch up to this illusion that I was that good. But anyways, we'll end up we'll end up going too long. But I appreciate that. And you are a coach, man. At least now you are. Because yeah. your your job is you you eliminated fear in your athletes that got them to perform at the state level where you know where they're like beating a team that they've never beaten in 20 years. That's a legacy. Absolutely. Awesome. Absolutely. Awesome, man. Yeah, now Thanks. we're saying goodbye. <laughs> Take care. See you soon, Jeff.